Hello. Welcome to the landmark Julius Caesar. This is the complete works. Gallic War, Civil War, Alexandrian War, the African War, and the Spanish War. And we're going to focus today on a part of uh, Julius Caesar's campaigns that I find particularly interesting. And that is his invasion of Britannia. And so in order to pick that up, we're going to uh, fast forward through the Gallic Wars to uh, page 118 of the landmark Julius Caesar and look at chapter 4, 18, 19, and 20 really outline the transition from uh, fighting and working in the area now known as France and his considerations of exploring the island of, of Britain. So we'll, uh, we'll pick it up at uh, 4.20 on page 120 and, and, and I'll paraphrase this section, uh, July, August 55 BC was the fourth year of the, the war uh, with the bridge over the Rhine and Caesar plans an expedition to Britain in the remaining weeks of the campaign season and gives his reasons. <clears throat> Very little of the summer remained. And although in these regions, winters came early, since all of Gaul lies towards the north, Caesar nevertheless was quite eager to sail to Britain. The reason was his knowledge that in nearly all the wars in Gaul, auxiliary forces had been sent out to our enemies from there. Moreover, he reckoned that even if the season were too short for waging war, it would still be very advantageous to him just to go to the island, get a personal impression of the type of people who live there, and reconnoiter the localities, the harbours, and the landings. All this was virtually unknown to the Gauls. Indeed, nobody but merchants go there without a compelling reason, and the merchants themselves know nothing beyond the sea coast, and only those parts of it that are opposite Gaul. For this reason, <clears throat> although he summoned merchants from everywhere, he could discover neither how large the island was, what nations inhabited it, and how populous these were, nor how they waged war and what their customs were in general, nor again, which harbors, if any, were suitable for larger numbers of ships. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there and we'll paraphrase a, a little bit again, and then we'll skip ahead a, a bit to uh, actually get into the landing and then what happens there at the landing, which will frame our, uh, be our frame of reference for looking at the Great Battles of History, the Battle of Britannia 55 BC, and we'll look at, at that particular battle and, and I'll uh, be sharing some images from that battle <clears throat> and hopefully some artwork and other stuff as well. So let's do the paraphrase. August, September 55 is the fourth year of the war. Uh, Caesar sends an officer ahead to reconnoiter the coast of Britain and himself departs with his army for the Atlantic coast. Upon receiving news of his plans, delegations arrive from nations in Britain offering surrender. Encouraging them, Caesar sends them back with an influential Gallic leader. And that's when we uh, now will pick up. Let's see. We will now pick up on 422. <clears throat> While Caesar was staying in this area in order to get ships ready, envoys came to him from a large part of the districts uh, of the Morini, who were to apologize for their actions during the previous campaign season. Being barbarians and unfamiliar with their customs, they said they had waged war on the Roman people, but now they promised they would do whatever Caesar ordered. And uh, this then, chapter then goes on to discuss the the fact that Caesar accepted their submission, and that most of the Marini and uh, of most of the Marini and makes final preparations for the expedition to Britain. So what I'm doing there is covering for the fact that I have uh, missed the uh, the chapter that I'm looking for, and we're now going to progress to that. So. For all uh, of these, now that all these matters have been settled, Caesar took advantage of the weather, which, with, uh, which was suitable for sailing, and set out around the time of the third watch. He ordered the cavalry to proceed to the farther harbour, and uh, in that regard, they're referring to uh, modern-day Ambertus, about six miles north of Boulogne. Let's see. And there, uh, to board the ships and follow him. 
Although they did not manage to do this quite as quickly as they might have, uh, uh, there was um, uh, no, he, he, seen, he himself reached Britain with the first group of ships around the fourth hour of the day. There he saw armed troops demonstratively posted on all the heights. Conditions in that area were such, and the cliffs hugged the sea so closely that a weapon could be hurled from the higher positions straight onto the beach. He considered... Uh, let me pause here. <clears throat> he considered this a very unsuitable site for disembarking and waited at anchor until the ninth hour, giving the rest of the ships time to join him there. But in the meantime, he called together the legates and military tribunes and told them that he had learned from what he had learned from uh, Volcensus, uh, Volcensus, I should say, and that he wished and what he wished them to do. He admonished them as demanded by military principles and especially warfare at sea, where conditions change quickly and unpredictably to carry out all his orders at the given signal and instantly. He then dismissed them, taking advantage of the fact that both the wind and the tide were favorable. He gave the signal, hoisted the anchors and sailed forward about seven miles and put the ships in a wide and open beach. And we look at the little perfect little note here. It says most scholars agree that with the west wind and the tide flowing northeast, the fleet sailed east and then north around the promontory of modern South Foreland and landed on the beach somewhere between Walma and Deal. But the barbarians recognized the Romans, what the Romans plans to do and sent ahead their cavalry and charioteers, a type of troop they commonly employ in battles, and followed with their remaining forces, trying to prevent our men from disembarking. For the following reasons, it was extremely difficult to land. Because of their size, the ships could anchor only in fairly deep water, yet the soldiers in an unfamiliar place with their hands occupied and burdened by the large and heavy weight of their armor and weapons had to jump from the ships. Finding steady footy, footing in the current and fighting with the enemy at the same time. The enemies, by contrast, either were standing on dry land or had gone a little into the water. Their limbs were completely unencumbered. They were very familiar with the terrain and they therefore boldly threw their weapons and drove forward with their horses, which were accustomed to this kind of action. All this frightened our men and they were altogether inexperienced at this kind of battle. They therefore did not push forward with the energy and the eagerness that normally displayed, they normally displayed in land battles. <clears throat> and we move on to 425, chapter 425. When Caesar became aware of the problem, problems, he gave orders to the warships, the appearance of which was less familiar to, to the barbarians, and which could maneuver faster in reaction to developing needs, to withdraw a little from the transports, then move forward with their oars, positioning them uh, themselves at the exposed flank of the enemy and drive them back with the slingshots, arrows and catapult missiles until they were removed from the beach. This maneuver proved very helpful to our men, the barbarians greatly impressed by the shape of the ships, the motion of the oars and the catapults, a type of weapon with which they were completely unfamiliar, stopped and backed off just a little. Our soldiers were still hesitant, particularly because of the depth of the sea. But the eagle bearer of the 10th legion, calling upon the gods to make what he was about to do turn out well for the legion, cried out, Jump down, fellow soldiers, unless you want to betray the eagle to the enemy. As for me, I will make sure to have done my duty to the state and the general. Having shouted this loudly, he threw himself from the ship and began to carry the eagle against the enemy. Then finally our men urged one another on not to let such a great disgrace happen. They all jumped down from the ships, from the ship. When those on the nearest ships saw them, they all followed suit and advanced on the enemy. The fighting was fierce on both sides. Our soldiers continued to be confused a great deal. Because they could not maintain rank, gain a firm footing, or closely follow their standards, instead they joined whatever standard from which ship they ran into. The enemy, on the other hand, were familiar with all the shallows, and when from the shore they saw men disembarking one by one from a ship, they spurred their horses towards them and attacked them in their hampered state. Many would, surren would surround a few, while others threw their weapons indiscriminately into the whole mass of men on their exposed flank. When Caesar saw this, he ordered the small boats attached to the warships, and likewise the boats used for reconnaissance, 
to be filled with soldiers, and he kept sending them to help those who he observed to be struggling. Once our men had gained a firm footing on dry land, and their fellow soldiers had caught up with them, they charged the enemy and put them to flight. But before they could, but before, but they could not pursue them for long, because our cavalry had not been able to stay on course and reach the island. This was one the one flaw that prevented Caesar from achieving his usual full success. And there's a note in regards to that. Ah, uh, yes, the island, Britain, delayed and then driven back by a storm. They never arrived there, so the, the cavalry never arrived. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So it was interesting then that uh, with the progress from there, the fourth year of the war on the coast of Britain, the leaders of the defeated Britons, uh, they surrendered to Caesar, blame the hostile reaction to his arrival on the ignorance of the masses and then offer hostages, and peace seems to have been secured. Uh, Caesar, at then some point after that, uh, leaves. Uh, they, uh, the, the cavalry doesn't get to make it over there, uh, and there's a lot of distress in Caesar's army. And in the fourth year, uh, in September of 55, Leaders of the Britons, seeing Caesar in a difficult situation, perceive there's an opportunity for them to uh, actually attack him again. Uh, so, you know, very feisty. Uh, they have at it and they have another battle. And there's another set of uh, uh, conflicts that occur, which uh, these are not covered in the Great Battles of History. But uh, there's a fair bit of uh, skullduggery uh, conducted by the Britons. And they attempt to uh, attack and isolate uh, a force that is trying to move some grain, I believe, from one, one part of the area to another. And the Britons launched this surprise attack on the Roman 7th Legion, which is collecting grain and uh, surrounded it with cavalry and chariots, uh, which uh, Caesar noticed, uh, noticed and then hurried out to relieve the men and they fought a battle. And uh, this time there were hostages taken uh, once the Britons surrendered and they were brought back to, back to France. So that's all I wanted to share with you, just a little reading here, and hopefully I'll try and scan or take some pictures of some of the artwork that's here in the book, some maps and some of the uh, funer funeral monuments and coins and things like that that are in this book. It's pretty interesting, and thanks for listening.